Happy birthday, Henry Ford. You're 150. Would have been. Would have been. Um, love Ian Whalen. See, he signed it. Ian's behind the camera, of course. Um, so today in After Drive, it was Henry Ford's birthday, and everybody's been showing him a lot of love. And, for... and, and talk about accomplishments and success of Ford. Exactly. That would be too easy for us. Ford's doing great now, but that would be too easy for us because everybody needs a little bit of an antagonist. And that's going to be us today on After Drive. Leo's got a history with Ford. He was there when some product that uh, wasn't exactly the best stuff came yeah, out. Yeah, uh, hopefully not bore you with the stories, but uh, the cars I was around when we were working for Ford Motor Company, they're going to come around in this list. Yeah, and we're, we're going to talk about our bottom five from Ford. So that's today on After Drive. So, Mikey, I like this after drive idea. Anyone can do a top 10 list. Yeah. We're doing what? We're doing the bottom list, the bottom five. The five worst Fords, we well, think? Well, our five worst Fords. I mean, our, we're going to probably have uh, some issues with the, our, each other's picks. So, that um, could be good. That could be fun. And in fairness to Ford, some of these on our list were like big sales successes. Yeah, yeah, they were huge, right? Yeah. So, it's not necessarily they were, I mean, and, and they came at a time when there were a lot of crappy cars out there. So, um, so it's these were the Ford's best crappy cars. Ford's best crappy cars. See, it's the best list. Also, wait till Louis Chevrolet's birthday. We're going to get him, too. So, <laughs> all right. So you were there. So to give us the backstory because you were at Ford. Okay, so the short version is yeah. from 77 to 85, I had joined Ford Motor Company coming out of school with my little MBA and was in the field helping wholesale cars to dealers. Then ended up at Renaissance Center when they owned the Renaissance Center coming up with the marketing plans to launch some of these cars. And wow. they made the list, you'll see. Yeah. All right, so let's just get right to it because the obvious choice, and I'm not even gonna say it because it's not on my list, is the Pinto. Yeah, we, you, you gotta start with Pinto, so what do you got? I gotta start with Pinto. You, no, I, I, first of all, for me, mm. Pinto was a great success. Okay, wow, really? 24 months. From, uh, from drawing board to production, first of all. Second and, of all. And how, how many months to the lawsuit? 80? <laughs> okay, good. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> the lawsuits per gallon were more than the mileage. Well, all right. Well, let's just say, no, it, it was the Ford Pinto. Styling was, I give it a, uh, I'll give it a seven on styling, right? But I will also give it a eight in, uh, in terms of, uh, interior room compared to, I mean, compared to like Volkswagen Beetle, Keep right, going. which is what they were going after. And also they were competing with the Chevy Vega, which they, they were both happening at the same time. And they were both kind of getting from zero to market as quickly as possible with these new cheap cars. And um, So know. my version of Pinto is really easy. The image of the thing was so damning to the Ford Motor Company at the time. Right. I got two stories. One, the only way I could wholesale Pintos to Ford dealers was when the truck would show up, you put the truck that they want in front of, behind the two Pintos that they didn't want, the truck guy unloads both cars, or you tell the dealer the only way you're going to get the truck you want is take the two Pinto. <laughs> That's how bad that was. So, Number two. Because they were, because trucks were flying off the Trucks the were shelf. great. No one yeah. wanted Pintos because no one was buying Pintos. <laughs> Number two. But by the way, what year? So this was later on oh, in Pinto 77, life. 77, Because they sold two million Pintos before that. Yeah, but they had a bad image and they stopped well, selling eventually, when they Well, eventually, eventually. So eventually. anyway. Anyway. But no, no it's. Okay. Number two story. Yeah. I swear to God, this is true. There was a Pinto brochure. And the basic Pinto they had in the brochure was kind of a brownish amber, whatever. Yeah. And it was the base car, so it didn't have the, the bright grill. And literally the color was burnt orange, and the oh, grill was no. called charcoal. And this was in the brochure in the middle of this, so it was wow. fun. Um, okay, so, for, so for, you're voting up for Pinto. I'm voting, all right, so now let's just face it. The build quality of a lot of these cars back then were, was crap. I mean, the Chevy Vega and the, and the Pinto were some of the- uh, It's all the, relative, but yes. I mean, I know somebody who bought a Pinto and the engine literally fell out well, keep, on the way home. Keep going for your list because when I get to mine, I've got a build quality okay. story for you. So I'm going to go with Pinto first. Yay. All right, I got another one. Fairmont. 417,000 beat Mustang as a sales leader. Yeah. On, okay, so it was technically the first car on the Fox body platform. Yes, it was. So, uh, but 
it had it was a it was just junk. But second of all, it had the horn. So for some reason, you may yeah, you yeah. may have a story about this. But Ford decided to take the horn off the steering wheel and put it on the side stalk. Because it was quite European. Is that what that was? Yeah. What European cars had a horn over here? How the hell do I know? I was living in New York, <laughs> wholesaling Fords. But anyway, yeah, that was the whole premise. But, it's but what the hell? I mean, honestly, like, I, you know, I rented one. I mean, I, I rented one. So this is actually before I could even drive. My parents rented one. And my dad kept jamming his thumb because he, he was a horn guy, right? So he would always <laughs> yeah. be on the horn. And like, but like anything happened. A truck pulled out six streets away. He, you know, come on. But so he jammed his thumb because he couldn't, like every time he hit the, the center of the wheel, nothing happened. Yeah, but think how much quieter the neighborhood was. See, it's Ford true. was trying. Um, no, really, what, what the hell is the deal with that? I don't know. As bad as Fairmont was, I've got a worse Fairmont for you. Okay. Remember the first downsized Thunderbird built off the Fox chassis? It looked like, yeah, it looked like the Fairmont Little with, with closed headlights. Off. Yeah, yeah so, so to me, that's the worst, my first worst Ford on the list. It was just a horrible car, but here come my two stories. Okay. One, I swear to God, these are true, <laughs> okay? I was asked to pitch the car to the dealers when we launched it here in New York. Okay. So I got up on stage and said, hey, ladies and gentlemen, dealers, here's the new Thunderbird. I'm here to make the car look bigger. <laughs> that was your joke. That was my downsizing joke. I got in trouble for that one. Second of all, my first company car. <laughs> Did you really get in trouble for that? Oh, because you're right. The, that was the year that, um, you know, the energy crisis had hit in the mid-70s. So right. by the late 70s, everything got downsized. Everything got really small. So the Thunderbird used to be a big car. And then I would it, was a tiny, it became like, what, it was f several feet shorter. New York with the dealers, it was, it was like open mic night. I mean, our meetings were hilarious. And dealers would complain about the headroom in the Thunderbird. And I would literally sit there across their desk with straight face and say, I don't have a problem. I don't understand. <laughs> um, the second one was my company car, Thunderbird. Yeah. was black, had red stripes, the uh, Michelin wheels and tires, all cool, right? Yeah. Uh, beautiful car. Get in it. Thunderbird in front of me. I looked to my right. The dash said Cougar. The sister car built the same plate. <laughs> I get out of the car. The passenger side was a Cougar. My driver's side was a Thunderbird. So they had attached the wrong... Yeah, a little bit of that quality build thing wow. you were talking about earlier. Wow. Job, job two job, at that point. Job, I don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right, so... Um, Thunderbird's mine. Thunderbird's yours. So, all right, so I got one, Leo. Ford EXP. <coughs> Go ahead. Really? Yeah. Two-seater. Yeah. I actually, I feel like I'm defending these now because I, but because the Ford EXP sort of looked okay. It had those weird well, pop-up headlights. See, here's where I get confused with Spinelliisms. Yeah. This is the worst list. Do you like the EXP or not? <laughs> it, it I, I think it's, it's probably one of the worst cars that they built. However, I think their heart was in the right place. And I think they, it, the EXP came at a time right before, I think, Ford had a sort of renaissance. It was that late 80s. Um, Ford really kind of felt like a forward-thinking car company in the late 80s, and partly because of Taurus, and also because they had made their cars sort of, and they used a little bit of cladding, but they, <laughs> they had... Well, how did cladding become a quality No, but it wasn't because it wasn't overdone. I mean, they, you remember the, the uh, Ford Escort GT kind of looked very sporty Into and very European. Into the, this is sort of 86, 87, okay. 88, 89. So cladding equals... Uh well, the way they did it, I think, okay. was look, still looked pretty good. Okay. They had, but the bumpers were incorporated into the rest of it color-wise. They were one of the first American car companies to do that because GM still had the crappy-looking bumpers. Anyway, the Ford EXP yes. was uh, just basically an Escort with two seats. Yes. There was some type of mind-meldy moment in Dearborn where they thought we needed a sports car. Right. And, and the rumors were talking about a sports car, so everyone got excited. Then they showed up with this frog-faced front drive piece of crap, yeah. okay, that couldn't get out of its own way. That was the problem. It couldn't get out of its own way. It and, was really... And you know how, you know really how these cars suck? The minute they tell you you have to order one as a company car, we know we're not selling them, okay? <laughs> so I had my white and black with red interior. Nice. Vinyl, I think. Vinyl. I would imagine. EXP. Piece of crap. Okay. Well, poor so EXP. So we agree. So we're actually agreeing on this one. So wow. EXP is on the list. Um, Pinto... I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that. Fairmont, so you're going to say yes to the Fairmont? Uh, Fairmont, no, it's a piece of crap, and the Thunderbird was a bigger one. Okay, all right. Well, so I've got one for you. Okay. The Granada. <laughs> Had that too. Go ahead. All right, so the Granada was a, 
mid-sized luxury car, basically, or not Heavy, it was American luxury. To your point, heavier build, yes. felt more quality, the interior was pretty nice, yeah. pretty quiet, came in some really wickedly strange colors, yes. greens and Very blues. 70s, and, yeah. yeah. But for the time, everyone liked the car. So not crappy? I mean, they to sold me, a lot of these, all of these cars, they sold no, a No, to me, Granada is not crappy. What is crappy is the Granada Lincoln Versailles. Oh. Remember? Cadillac did a Seville, little, little oh my God. more boutique-y shaped yes. luxury car. Ford didn't have anything, Lincoln. So guess what? Let's take the friggin' Granada and stick a bigger padded the roof Versailles. on it. The Versailles, that was a terrible, terrible car. It was the Panamera of the time, because you'd be in the car, and it was nice to be in the interior. You'd get out of the car, and it would be like, what the? <laughs> Oh, yeah, but at least the Panamera is great to drive. The Versailles was was just, it was exactly like the Granada. It may have been... That was a sarcastic comparison. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay I'm not comparing. Just making sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Versailles goes on okay, my Okay, Versailles list. was on your list, but, um, but I must say something about the Seville, Cadillac, the Cadillac Seville that they were competing against uh -huh. was the second most expensive Cadillac that they made. It's not like Cadillac made a small Cadillac and made it the entry-level car. Like they made it smaller and they went after Mercedes and they were selling that thing for like, the, it was like 17.5 in the, you know, in showrooms. The only thing more expensive than a Seville was like a Fleetwood 60, whatever the. Well, again, thinking, thinking I remember what the hell was going on. Seville, Seville was a good thing for Cadillac. Right. Ford was lacking. So yeah. they took their first step to do something as quickly as possible. Eventually they built an actually dedicated Lincoln Continental Right, that's it. true. They even that's ripped true. off that fast backy rear thing. Well, the, by the 80s, they, they but, had, had made, actually started making strides again. This was sort of like, a, a lot of the late 70s cars felt like they were all just sort of patchwork because the economy was so bad. So they just took what, what kind I'm not of, disagreeing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we sold the same car 14 times. Matter of fact, to that <laughs> extension, okay, you had Gran Torino. Right. You had Thunderbird built off that. Uh -huh. Then you had the Gran Torino Elite. Wait a minute, uh, your oh, Gran Torino your Elite? No, you had it on your list, oh, okay. the Gran Torino Elite. So what the heck was that? Well, that's the whole point of platform sharing packaging yeah. to its like extreme. You know, you change the opera window and it's a different car. Opera window. That, see, that's another thing. That's like one of those, you know, those conceits from the 70s. It's like, what, I mean, what was the deal with that? You were going to the opera, so you need to look out the window? I mean, like, what, the, what was the, was there I, supposed to be like opera glasses? You're asking me questions. I don't know the answer. But, to I mean, it could be like opera glasses, but it was one of those dopey, like Landau roof, right? I mean, Landau car in the old days was was the um, the driver was outside but the passenger right. was inside right. was that but that was like the 20s yeah so or even in like the buggy days hey I, I guarantee you can go someplace at some dealership either in mid america or probably here in new york yeah. and find padded roofs on cars that they're currently selling I mean, perhaps it, it that was a dealer that became a dealer thing you're right anyway okay. all right so we've got the the weird gran torino elite with the with the side uh, stri what, what, what do you call the, uh, the, the body the molding, body molding yeah. but they were like, well, depending what on which kind of water. Oh, it was vinyl-y. Yeah, it was like something. weird, but soft vinyl, right? It was some of them, strange. Sure. Okay. Yeah, based on the car you ordered, it was where they put the molding. Yeah. So Thunderbird, <laughs> Gran Torino, <laughs> Elite. Just work your way up the car. All right, so I wanna, I wanna just bring out the Mustang 2 because <laughs> the Mustang 2, yeah. Is an obvious one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because they, they took the Mustang off the Torino platform, right? Lee Iacocca. Yes. Was God yes. to that car. Yes, he was. Most Italian households, there's Sinatra, Pope, Iacocca. Iacocca, right? right? Exactly. I mean, that's an obvious yeah, that was <laughs> Three pictures in yeah, the kitchen. Right. So anyway, so Iacocca did what? So Iacocca, well, they took the, um, so by 73, the Mustang had exploded out to the Torino platform. It I mean, I'm getting, huge. It right, but huge it was in car. that, right? It was I think on that so. platform. I think so. And then they took it off that and put it on the Pinto platform. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Which Iacocca would go on to do at Chrysler with the K-Car platform becoming the platform for everything for Chrysler and actually saved Chrysler with that. And by the way, one might argue that the Crappy as it was, Mustang II saved Ford because they sold more of those totally. than they had in the 60s as a pony car. It was actually an economy car that was more sort of up market. Well, and I liked how the whole thing evolved. It started with a V6, a European V6, that was originally the German Cologne engine from Capri. Also, yeah, Capri, right. Okay. Yeah. So it had a four-cylinder overhead cam, 2.3, and mm -hmm. then the V6. Right. But then it all took hold, and we had, like, V8s. 
and King the Cobras. Cobra, the King Cobra. Charlie's Angel. Ran yes, Farrah okay. had Farrah had the, uh, the the blue the white with the blue stripe Cobra. But Jacqueline Smith had the sort of the Gia. I That's think right. Was. They, they, they put all the Mustang had, based on their personality. Exactly, they did. Except that um, poor Sabrina got stuck with the Pinto. She had a like. A, <laughs> it was like. And I, I, I thought Sabrina was hot. I don't know. I don't, oh, yeah, I well, she makes my list, too. So now we've moved from cars to... Yes, to Charlie's Angels. And, but that's, it's, I mean, it is and the And what of BJ and the Bear? What? BJ and the Bear drove a Kenworth, right? It's not, okay, anyway. So, so we've, got, um, we've got Fairmont, we've got Granada, or Versailles. We actually took Granada off. So it's now Lincoln, Versailles, uh, Mustang 2, EXP. I feel like I'm doing a lottery card. No, 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 this is a lottery card. It's actually the, the Ford 70s lottery. All right. Um, but if you win, you lose. Okay. That's kind of yeah, thing. Uh -huh. um, we have to say Etzel, um, even though Etzel wasn't... I would say not, but keep going. Well, the problem with Etzel was that they spent a ton of money, but they also launched it into one of the worst recessions since the war. I mean, it was the, it was the 58 recession was bad. I, so, so, so you like Edsel in effect? I don't really like the looks of it a lot. I think the thing is that they, they made a car that was sort of a little bit ugly and, par and polarizing, but it, it was not a terrible car. Edsel becomes a terrible car to me the way Pinto is a terrible car. You may be right about the circumstances and the product, but it's like Obamacare. The perception and the reaction have far exceeded what the car is all about. So Edsel is a problem for Ford right. because it's everyone's punchline. It still is the punchline for failure. Yeah. It's the it's punchline for failure. And that's the problem is that that that's oh, not oh God, necessarily he's changing his opinion. He's no, changing. it's not necessarily their fault. All right. So fine, we got So are we leaving Edsel or are we taking Edsel off? You can leave Edsel on the list if All right, you want. So or you can take it off if you like. I would like to take I didn't it know off. We take it off. I'm taking it off. Okay. All right. So now we got Fairmont, Mustang 2, uh, you got your Lincoln Versailles, you got the 40 XP. My baby Thunderbird. Pinto. So what's next? So one of your motorsports heritage cars, the first Ford GT, this was it 64? Yeah, I couldn't do the bad Ford list without tapping into racing. So okay. the, the, when Ford launched their GT project, yeah. the first time they went to Le Mans was 1964. Yeah. Okay, cars had like a Coletti gearbox, 24 hour race, all three cars barely made it like the first and second hour. The car was just a disaster. Wire wheels, not built well. The only way it succeeded was after they took it to Shelby, mm -hmm. brought it, sorry, UK people, to America to fix the car. And then the next cars became American built and it was all a big success. All the way through the John Wire days, yeah. which funny I mentioned that name because he came from Aston Martin yeah. to run Ford Advanced Vehicles to start the Ford GT program which was the failure that makes it on the list. Because that whole Ford GT, Ford in Europe, was a big, big thing for the company. It was very important. Mm -hmm. And it was failing that first two years. Yeah. So. I would say, I would disagree with putting it on a list of all the Ford failures. And we could, I mean, I think that the whole Ford GT program was a success, just the idea of them doing it. In the face of, Indy, and there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of uh, negative press coming around for racing yeah, at that point. Yeah, but bad car is bad car. That was a okay. bad car. It was All a right. bad race car. It was almost as bad as the Tucker Ford Miller collaboration in oh. 1935. Front wheel drive? Well, Tucker convinced Ford to, to build 10 race cars for Indy 500 with Miller. Okay. Front wheel drive, to your point, and somehow the steering box got next to the exhaust. So in the early laps, they all kind of failed. Ford had on their face. Tucker walked away to do other brilliant things. That But Tucker. that's another bad But he was car. that Tucker. That he was that Preston, Preston Tucker. Tucker. Yeah. yeah. But that's another bad race car. Wow. I did not know that. Um, so, okay. Well, wait a minute. So is it first Ford GT on the list or are we doing Miller? Uh, well, if you allow me to put it on the list, I like, Mil I like the Ford GT on the list as a bad race car. The Miller was just like a little vignette. All right. All right. So we'll keep, we'll keep the first Ford GT. Um, oh, this is a good one. This is another one of yours. This is the last one that you have. Ah. The Heritage Edition Ranchero. <laughs> what the hell is a Heritage Edition Ranchero? So I'm assuming everyone understands what the Ranchero El Camino concept was. Yeah. Ranchero was at the end of its life in, I don't know, 79, 80, something like that. And on the Thunderbird side, we had the top of the line luxury edition called the Heritage Thunderbird. So at the end of the model year, turns out we had too many Heritage Thunderbird front seats, velour and leather. Uh -huh. So someone in Dearborn got this brilliant idea. 
to put the front seats, which we had too many, in the last Rancheros, which we were closing out production. Next thing you know, a $12,000 Heritage Edition Ranchero <laughs> that no one friggin' wanted. I mean, this was a whole So wait a minute, tell, tell me about that. Like, how often did stuff like that happen where there was like seats left over and we had to, you had to create like an addition around like some stuff that had been done? I, I have a feeling. We, oh, we got extra stripes. Let's, it's the rally edition. I have a feeling more than we knew. I, I can tell you that each region, each district had the flexibility to do their own special equipment type vehicle, special mm -hmm. edition, and, and to help the wholesale. I became notorious of that. So literally, by checking off boxes on the RPO, some type of special order type process, yeah. I was tapping into the leftover parts. <laughs> <laughs> Causing trouble. Ma selling cars. All right. Selling cars. All right, so we've got to narrow this down to the top bottom five. OK, fine, let's go. All right, so um, OK, Fairmont, yes or no? No, Fairmont's a good car. Fairmont Thunderbird, to me, would be the first one on the list. Ah. Like Thunderbird. All right, so you're right. It, it, it's a Fairmont with conceit, which makes it worse. All right, so let's put that. That'll be number five. Why'd you look at me when you said conceit? <laughs> keep going. All right, keep going. Um, okay, we're, this is in no particular order because we'll just let we'll let these guys figure it out. Okay, um, Granada. You said I, I liked Granada. Actually, I thought it was a decent car. Okay, I'll, I'll give Granada. Um, except that you also didn't like the oh, I, Lincoln Versailles. I hate so for the, the Lincoln same Versailles. reason for the same reason as the Fairmont T-Bird, it's a bad car with conceit. The pretense was just flawed. It was it was a band-aid at the time, but it was a bad car. Okay, that's in too. All right. So that'll be um, Mustang 2, let's leave it to the end. Sure, whatever you want to do. Because I think there might be a, a, a difference of opinion on this. But yeah, anyway, yeah, because I'd throw it on the list, but keep going. Okay, Etzel I'm taking it off. It's fine, off. Fine. Um, EXP. Bad car. Yeah. All right. Bad it was, car. It was a front drive. EXP is on the list. Two, okay. Good. Okay. Um, Pinto. We got it. I guess Pinto has to be. Well, on I thought list. you started the. I, I'm, a de, I'm a Pinto defender. So now you. We don't have to put it on the list. I think it was a bad situation. It might not have been a bad. All right. Car. Screw it. Pinto's off. Pinto's off the list. See, I'm, I'm helping you. Look at that. I thought huh? we would be. Uh, we'd have yeah, more. Whatever, All right. Your first four GT. I think it's a bad car because it was a bad car. It failed miserably. But I think the the um, the whole like the idea that Ford was actually going after Ferrari was a good thing. So I think everything within that umbrella was good. But we're not ranking the ideas. Otherwise, we'd go back and have the Edsel discussion and the Pinto discussion. The car sucked. Okay. The later generation GTs were brilliant, and maybe that suckiness motivated success. But that car, bad race car. Suckiness motivates success. I'm gonna get a T-shirt with that on it. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's take, well, all right, so all right, we'll put the 4 GT You're on. You're going to give me one? We'll give you the 4 GT, uh, the first 4 GT. Fairmont T-Bird's on it. Okay, here you go. What? Here you go. One or the other. Mm. Grand Torino Elite or uh, Heritage Edition Ranchero? They built more Elite, so that's the worst car. Because they built more of them? Sure. I guess you're right. The, the effect, the overall effect of, of the Torino Elite. <laughs> Um, okay, cool. So we're down. All right, that's a, it. That so we're down to Mustang 2. Oh, okay. Is the Mustang 2 going to knock another car off the list just because it's crap? Even though Mike Musto loves, my mic's all over the okay. floor. Even though Mike Musto loves the steering gear from Mustang 2 because they're in most hot rods. That's right. It's very compact rack and pinion situation, right? That's and even though Iacocca came up with uh, Mustang 2 for a good reason, mm -hmm. shitty, shitty, shitty Mustang, bad Mustang on the list. I say no, and here's why. <laughs> Farrah Fawcett Majors, three words. Well, you know what, if she came with every car, don't, well, don't do the joke that's gonna go with that line, okay? Sure, whatever you wanna do with Mustang too, but it'd never be on my list of, it would be on my list of bad cars. I'm taking it off, wow. off the list. Well, it's your show, it's after drive. Um, King Cobra, also off the list, okay. That's well, by the way, back to your cladding comment. Yeah. What a festival of cladding that was. Yeah, well, I, cladding, cladding isn't always bad. What do we got? So what about the fans? All right, that's it. We're done. Well, we're done, but what about the fans? What do you guys think? Yeah, well, what do you guys think? Which are the worst Fords in history? Um, oh, and I got to add, because we have completely ignored Europe, and I'm going to oh, frankly play to a little bit of... Oh, God. The point is, tell us what Ford cars around the globe we may have missed as bad Fords. Yeah, very good. Happy birthday, Henry. Happy birthday, Henry Ford. You're 150, and you did a lot of good things, but some things, not so much.
that's after drive for today. Don't forget, slash drive.tv, at drive on Twitter, facebook.com slash drive TV, also drive.jalopnik.com, and uh, we're on Pinterest now. So post and pin some crap. That's it. See you guys next week.